She did her PhD with uh, Fritz Hacke, who was one of the pillars of the field. The, uh, then she, she had worked in many different places, like the University of Arnstadt, the University of Essen, where she did her PhD, in Mexico, in, in China, and nowadays she is in, in South Korea, in Daejeong. And she will talk to us about experiments with superconducting microwave resonators simulating artificial graphene. Okay. okay. Please. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and also for giving me the possibility to be here to give a talk in the colloquium and also to organize a school on quantum chaos. So today I will speak about experiments which were done during my time in Germany at the University of Darmstadt. There I was in the group of Achim Richter. He did experiments with superconducting microwave cavities which we used to simulate uh, properties of so-called quantum billiards. And then later on in uh, Lanzhou, we continued these experiments. And that's what I will be talking about. So before I start with the experiments, I will briefly introduce billiards. Uh, I have quantum billiards, uh, relativistic billiards. And then um, the experiments were done with microwave billiards, which simulate uh, quantum billiards. And the main aspects we are, we are looking at were aspects of quantum chaos. So, and then I will speak about these experiments. Um, so, first of all, what is a billiard? I mean, the people from the school already know, but um, I just briefly repeat. So, you have a, if you have a point-like particle, it moves freely inside a bounded region. And when it um, comes to the boundary, then it's reflected according to the rules of mirror reflection. And um, the nice things of such, um, of, about such billiards is that you ju just need to change the shape of your billiard and you can produce anything between integrable and fully chaotic. So therefore, these are, this is a system which is used uh, or was used a lot in context of quantum chaos. So depending on the shape, like here's a billiard with an integrable dynamics, here's one with a chaotic dynamics, it's a so-called Africa billiard. I mean, it has the shape of Africa if you reflect it along this boundary. And um, a circle billiard, um, the dynamics is integrable, so um, you bound a particle will be reflected uh, always with the same angle at the boundary, and uh, you will have a, such a regular structure. Whereas when you start with one trajectory, one initial condition, and then wait long enough, then the trajectory will fill the whole um, billiard area. So and the characteristics of um, chaos is uh, exponential instability, which leads to unpredictability of the motion. So if you infinitesimally change initially initial conditions, then you will get a completely different trajectory. And the central question of quantum chaos now is how you can um, um, get information on the classical dynamics by just looking at quantum properties. So the manifestations of classical chaos and properties of quantum systems. So one aspect of quantum chaos is the understanding of the classical dynamics in terms of the properties of the eigenvalues of the corresponding quantum system. So the corresponding uh, quantum billiard is uh, the quantum system which corresponds to a billiard, and it's the eigenvalues are obtained by solving the Schrödinger equation for a free particle and imposing uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions at the walls. I mean, it's a hard wall billiard, the particle is reflected according to the rules of mirror reflection, and this is then uh, described by imposing uh, the Schlee boundary conditions along the boundary of the billiard. So and what one then does, so one uh, computes the eigenvalues, and then one will get an energy spectrum, and um, in the context of quantum chaos, now one is interested in properties of the eigenvalues that form this sequence. So there are uh, central, two central conjectures in the context of quantum chaos. One is by Berry and Tabor. They showed explicitly that if you have a typical um, integrable system and look at the spectral properties of the eigenvalues, then the eigenvalues behave like Parsonian random numbers. And um, 
uncorrelated random numbers. So the spectral properties are well described by those of a Poissonian process, if you have a typical integrable system. On the other hand, I mean, as stated by Bohigas, Giannoni, and Schmidt, and also before it had been um, not noticed by Cassati and Michael Berry, so, namely, when you have a system which is classically chaotic, and now you look at the properties of the eigenvalues, so fluctuation properties in the eigenvalue spectrum, then, um, according to that conjecture, they are well described by those of random matrices of the eigenvalues of random matrices from the so-called Gaussian ensembles. So, and this has been um, proven now in a large amount of systems, and one type of systems are these quantum billiards. So the, and, and what to which of these, so, so there are three Gaussian ensembles uh, depending on the universality class of your system. Um, if you have a system which is classically chaotic and preserves time reversal invariance, then um, the properties of the quantum system are well described by those of real symmetric random matrices from the so-called Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. It's called orthogonal ensemble because um, the universality class is the uh, orthogonal one. On the other hand, if you have a classically chaotic system in which time reversal invariance is fully violated, then they are well described by those of the eigenvalues of complex Hermitian matrices from the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And um, what we did, I mean, uh, in our, what, and what I will talk about is the properties of um, certain billiards and uh, their, the study of their spectral properties. So, I mean, the one of the central conjecture is that the spectral properties of a system whose classical ca counterpart is chaotic, if it's a typical system, then um, they are universal, so for all, independently on whether you look at an atomic nucleus, whether you look on a billiard, or whether you look at, for example, a quantum graph, uh, you will always find the same properties. However, to find these properties, one first needs to get rid of system-specific properties, and one system-specific properties is the spectral density. So when you go up in energy in a nucleus, then you know that the spectral density it increases exponentially with square root of e. If you look at the um, eigenvalues in a quantum billiard and increase energy or the wave number which is given by square root of e, then you will realize that uh, it grows linearly in k. And for a quantum graph, it's a constant. So in these system-specific properties need to be removed before you can uh, compare to random matrix theory because random matrix theory describes universal properties. And this is done by unfolding. Unfolding means that you um, rescale the eigenvalues or the energy levels in such a way that the spectral density is uniform. So it's constant, and usually it's unfolded to mean spacing one. So the whole procedure is uh, called unfolding. These are examples of chaotic systems, yeah. No, they are all chaotic. Uh, I don't understand you. Maybe you use the phone or... Yes, yes. When, you, when it's integrable, then it would look differently because then you have uncorrelated random um, level spacings. It always goes like K. This is independent on the dynamics, yeah. This is a general property. I mean, it was uh, derived, for example, by Balion when he, he looked at the properties of microwave cavities, and there you get this, a so-called Y law, for example. And um, yeah, so these have to be uh, removed, and this is done by unfolding. Unfolding is done by the first thing you do, you count the number of eigenvalues you find below a given energy E. This gives you the integrated spectral density. And this then is decomposed into a smooth part and a fluctuating part. So you will have a small, slowly um, changing part and one which uh, fluctuates rapidly about the uh, mean value. And then um, unfolding is done by replacing the energy eigenvalues by, um, the, um, by um, the, the smooth part evaluated at the value of these eigenvalues. And this then gives you 
um, energy levels which have mean spacing one and the uniform um, distribution. However, the, of course, the fluctuations, they don't change in the spectrum. And so for a quantum billiard, this is easily done because there you have White's formula, which is valid for any billiard, for a circle and for an Africa billiard. And it um, tells us that the uh, integrated spectral density, it goes uh, quadratic in K. So this A is the area of your billiard, U is the circumference, and then you have some constant which contains, in, um, which depends on how many corners you have in curvature. So, and these, of course, are system-specific properties, this area and the circumference, and so by unfolding, you get rid of these uh, properties. Then um, there are different statistical measures which um, give you uh, information on the fluctuation properties in an eigenvalue spectrum. So one is the nearest neighbor spacing distribution. For that one, I mean, this is not yet unfolded, so it's um, not so good to choose that one. But what you do, you look, uh, you compute the spacings between neighboring eigenvalues, and then uh, you can compute the, uh, the distribution of nearest neighbor spacings. And then when you have an integrable system, then it would decay like e to the minus s exponentially with the spacing. On the other hand, when you have a cortic system with preserved time reversal invariance, then it uh, is zero at spacing zero. That is the probability that two eigenvalues have the same eigenvalue um, so that you have a degeneracy is equal to zero. And um, it falls off Gaussian-like for large spacings. Whereas when you have a time reversal invariance violation, then it goes like S square. So you can already, when you look at the spacing distribution, you can see whether First of all, whether your system is chaotic or not chaotic, and secondly, you can also distinguish between time reversal invariant and time reversal non-invariant systems. I mean, I will show you an example where you have um, this behavior, but the system as a total is not, um, time reversal is uh, not violated. So these are short-range correlations. We also use the number variance. So to get the number variance, you have to count the number of levels in an interval of length L. Uh, you compute the average value, and then from that one, you can compute the variance, and then you get a, a statistical measure for um, the dynamics of the corresponding classical system. Another one is, uh, which is used often as the so-called Dyson meter statistics. It's the least mean square deviation of the integrated spectral density from the straight line best fitting it, and it gives you information on the rigidity of your spectrum. I mean, if the eigenvalues are completely uncorrelated, then you don't have any rigidity. So here are two examples. I mean, for the rectangle billiard, it's an integrable with chaotic dynamics. Africa billiard is one with, uh, with regular dynamics. Africa billiard is one with chaotic dynamics. And here I compare to Poisson, this is Poisson, so the dashed lines are Poisson, and then you have uh, um, GUE, this is the dash dotted line, and GOE, this is a black full line. So when comparing here, I show nearest neighbor spacing distribution, integrated nearest neighbor spacing distribution, sigma 2 and delta 3. So for the nearest neighbor spacing distribution, one finds good agreement. For number variance, um, it, it deviates from Poisson above a certain value, but this you will always find in a rectangular billiard. You would need like um, one, several one hundred thousands of eigenvalues to get agreement with uh, Poisson and such in a rectangular billiard. Because, I mean, in reality, of course, the eigenvalues are not Poissonian distributed, but um, when you take sufficiently many of them, then you will find uh, Poissonian, properties of Poissonian numbers. And for the up, hmm? What's that? Yeah. And again. Ah, whether there are qualitative differences in the partition functions for systems who are chaotic or not chaotic, like that. So partition function, what do you mean? Uh, so you mean a special measure? No, I don't understand. But, but partition is for me something very general. But maybe later we can, yeah. 
because I mean the, if you mean the joint probability distribution of the matrix elements, it differs. It depends on beta. I mean, for the Hamiltonian itself, it's just e to the minus trace h square, and for the eigenvalues, you have a, a difference, ei minus ej to the power of beta times e to the minus um, e square, and this beta, it depends on, it's one for goe, two for gue, and four for gse. But I can, we can maybe talk later. So I don't, I'm not sure whether I understood you. Okay. So in this here, for, for the GO, for the Africa period, you find very good agreement with uh, GOE. So this Africa period is an ideal system if you try to find one which has a chaotic dynamics because it doesn't have um, non-universal contributions like other systems. So this is um, now, and as I mentioned in the beginning, um, we used, in Darmstadt, we used uh, microwave cavities to obtain the eigenvalues of a quantum billiard. And this can be done by using the analogy between Helmholtz equation and um, the Schrödinger equation for a quantum billiard. As I explained, you have to solve the free space Schrödinger equation with the Schlee boundary conditions. And when you now take such, uh, this is a metallic, um, microwave cavity, which is made from niobium. It has a shape of a stadium billiard. And as long as you choose the frequencies of the microwaves which are sent into that resonator below a certain maximum frequency, which is given by the velocity of light divided by two times the height of your billiard, then you will have a two-dimensional Schrödinger equation. And because then the electric field will be perpendicular to the top and bottom plate, so only EZ is then non-zero, whereas EX and DY are zero. So then you will get a Helmholtz equation which is identical to the Schrödinger equation of the corresponding quantum billiard. And this, of course, only holds when you can neglect um, absorption into the walls. So, and then, uh, so we use such systems to obtain the eigenvalues of a quantum billiard and the wave functions. I mean, like 20 years ago, this was a very good method to get several thousands of eigenvalues because their computers were not that, that well developed, so they were happy to get um, eigenfrequencies from these measurements. So, and to obtain the eigenvalues, what one does, one needs to measure resonance spectra. So one sends microwaves into the cavity at some antenna and receives it at the same or another one. And then you, by this, you can measure the scattering matrix, uh, which goes uh, scattering process from antenna one to antenna two. So in between, the microwaves will scatter around inside and then they will, at some point, they will go out. And then um, the S to one absolute value square is just given by the microwave power coupled out to the microwave power coupled in. Now when you um, plot this quantity versus frequency, then you get extremely sharp resonances as long as um, the cavity is superconducting. And this is important because the eigenfrequencies are obtained by as the positions of these resonances. That is, if you have well-isolated resonances, then it's possible to get eigenvalues, eigenfrequencies, but if you have overlapping one, then um, it's impossible. So and in this system, um, we obtain several thousands of eigenvalues using such uh, cavities. It's superconducting conditions. To get it superconducting, it's either made from niobium, which is um, superconducting at um, liquid helium temperature, or you can take a brass cavity and cover it with lead. Then you also will have a superconducting cavity, and which is superconducting at liquid helium temperature. So this uh, cavity was put into um, so, uh, such a cavity, and um, I mean, it's a cylindrical box, so it was put into it, and then um, the cryostat was filled with uh, liquid helium. Then it was, by this, it was cooled down to, um, to 4 Kelvin, and then you will reach like quality factors of even higher than 10 to 6 in some cases. So here I compare a, measure, a spectrum which was measured at room temperature. Which one, with one which was measured even at 2 Kelvin, because in the beginning, I mean, the Achim Richter, he is uh, a nuclear physicist. He builds accelerators. Uh, so we have a, an accelerator in the cellar of the Darmstadt, 
of in, in Darmstadt. And so he just put a cavity into the accelerator and cooled it down to 2 Kelvin. And then, I mean, you reach uh, quality factors of up to 10 to the 8. And this was enough to obtain um, all eigenvalues in the range of frequency less than f max, where f max is determined by the height of the billiard. So here's one example. Um, this one here, they used the cavity which had the shape of a circle. Here one which had the shape of half is Limasson billiard. Limasson billiard is also an example for chaotic billiard. And um, these are, I mean, here I just show the nearest neighbor spacing distribution and delta three statistics for the integrable one, you find agreement with, um, uh, with Poisson, and for the chaotic one, you find agreement with GOE. So these are measurements which were done in Darmstadt. And here, this is a review article where we write about several experiments at uh, superconducting conditions. So now I will come to another kind of experiments which was done and first started in Darmstadt and then we continued in, in China. It's, um, these are billiards which are used to simulate properties of graphene. So first of all, what um, is graphene? So graphene is a layer, two-dimensional layer of carbon, carbon atoms which are arranged on a honeycomb lattice. And the honeycomb lattice is um, formed by two triangular lattices, and this structure then leads to, uh, um, I mean, this band structure, which um, became very interest of, was of high interest because at the, the conduction and the ba valence band um, touch each other conically at the six corners of the first Brignan zone, and in the region of these cones, um, it exhibits uh, relativistic um, properties. So that, that was one of the reasons why it became of um, interest. Also, we started working with so-called graphene billiards, and were especially interested in the energy range um, around these um, conical um, touch points where the system is effectively described by the Dirac equation of a massless spin one-half particles. So you have uh, one Dirac equation for one triangular lattice and another one for the other one. So in total, the, um, I mean, it's, this is called Dirac equation, even though it's a two-dimensional one, but um, this is was, uh, I will come back to it. And, um, the, but the graphene billiard, it's described by a four-dimensional Dirac equation, which consists of two blocks of that form, one with a plus sign and one with a minus sign, so one for the k plus point and one for the k minus point. So, and therefore it became of interest. We also, I will also show some uh, possibilities to simulate um, the, the properties in the vicinity of the cones using billiards. So, and to realize such a system, uh, we used um, um, a lattice structure, I mean, of metallic cell cylinders which are forming a triangular lattice, and then you, they are arranged on a triangular lattice, and um, then uh, for frequencies below the maximum frequency, the propagating modes are solutions of the scalar Helmholtz equation, which is equivalent to the Schrödinger equation with uh, holes at the positions of the uh, cylinder. So that's what you, so you would have to solve such a um, um, Schrödinger uh, eigenvalue problem with Schrödinger equation, and when you do this, what you will find that you will find that the, the band structure of such um, tri triangular lattice structure is exactly the same as for a graphene billiard. So we use this fact to simulate properties of graphene. So and in this case here, the black circles are the, the metallic cylinders. And um, the um, voids in between form the hexagonal lattice. So the electric field is essentially distributed in that region, and it forms the hexagonal lattice because it's um, has a it's peaked at the voids between two cyl three cylinders. So it's in this case it's the electric field which forms this hex um, this uh, graphene structure. So and uh, to obtain um, a microwave, it's called microwave Dirac billiard, to obtain a, a simulation of a so-called graphene billiard. I mean, graphene billiard is obtained by cutting 
a shape out of a hexagonal lattice, like here we cut out an Africa shape, or here a rectangular shape, and then you get uh, so-called graphene billiards, and if you have a gra graphene flake, then electrons cannot escape, so you can use such graphene billiards with uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions to simulate uh, graphene flakes. I mean, of course, only up to a certain level. You can never exactly get everything, but on, on the level of tight binding model, you can use these graphene billiards to simulate properties of graphene. And in our case, um, electromagnetic waves would simply go out, like in these experiments, I mean, which I just showed. We use such structures to do uh, scattering experiments, and um, now if we want to simulate a billiard, we need to put uh, this metallic structure into a cavity with walls, so there is um, metallic walls, so you will have along the boundary, you will have um, um, there is boundary conditions like in a billiard. So what we essentially do, we take a microwave billiard and add um, cylinders, which are arranged on a triangular lattice to get a, something which we can use to simulate properties of graphene billiards. And this, these, we call them Dirac billiards, even though they behave like um, they are described by the Dirac equation only in a certain frequency range, as you will see. So, yeah? Ah, yeah. The boundaries. The conditions at the boundaries continue being as before for the electrodes. Yeah, in this case, we, we choose the Dirichlet boundary conditions because they are all made from metal. Also, the cylinders, at the walls of the cylinders, you also have Dirichlet boundary conditions. And this then uh, makes sure that the electromagnetic field, it forms this hexagonal structure because it's like multiple reflection at the cylinders. And um, we, I mean, in Darmstadt, we use two shapes. One is a rectangular shape, another one is a Africa shape. So in each case, um, we, the, the, the cylinder structure was milled out of a metal plate, which was made from brass, so like 900 cylinders. And then you can get a graphene billiard, which had more than 1,000 uh, sides, essentially. And to get it superconducting, it was covered with lead, which is superconducting at the critical temperature of 7.2 Kelvin. And then uh, we had a superconducting cavity at 4 Kelvin. And the height was chosen equal to 3 millimeter because then you have a, then the maximum frequency below which you have the analogy between a quantum billiard and um, the cavities is at 50 gigahertz, so we, uh, th this is a lot in our frequency range. So we obtained with this height, we obtained uh, 5,000 eigenvalues. So here, from, this is a measured spectrum from zero to, from 20, I mean, the, it has a band structure and the first propagating modes are found be above 20 uh, gigahertz, and then here you have a big band gap where you ha don't have any propagating modes. And in between, you see two um, regions of low density, and these are two uh, Dirac points. We call them Dirac points, the touching points, the conical touching points are either called K points or Dirac points. So we have essentially twice um, the span structure, which is typical for graphene, in two frequency regions. So now I will first now start with that part and show results, and then later I will just um, come also to the second one. So in, in for around this first Dirac point, we found like 1,600 frequencies, and then you now plot the integrated spectral density. So you count, count the number of eigenfrequencies below a so given frequency, and then you get uh, something which looks like that. So it's uh, completely different than what you would get if you have uh, an empty billiard without the metallic cylinders. So and this is typical for graphene. I mean, you have something with, uh, along, along the bent edges. I mean, bent edges are these. These parts here I call bent edges. Here's another bent edge. In between, you have uh, some high um, devil spectral density. There you have kings. And here you have a plateau around the Dirac point where the resonance density is quite low. And when you plot now, this is the integrated spectral density, this is the spectral density, then you see 
two sharp peaks and a port minimum. The port minimum is around the Dirac point. And these two sharp peaks, they evolve into one over singularities when you uh, increase the number of voids or the number of sides of your graphene billiard. And one over singularities is something that you find in any two-dimensional periodic lattice structure. So and here we have two, and um, here in that region you have, um, these are band edges. So here too, you can also explain it when you, here you have the band structure of graphene. So you have the band edges correspond to the so-called gamma points. So here you have one, and this is the upper band edge. It also is a called gamma point. So the corner is called gamma point, and then the one over singularities are at the saddle points of the band structure. There you have, um, I mean, there you have these singularities, and the Dirac point is at the positions of these six conical points. So here it's also plotted as a density plot. So here you have your six um, Dirac points. These, um, these crossings are the saddle points, and in, inside you have a Isofrequency lines are circles, and then you have isofrequency lines, which are straight lines connecting the saddle points when you are at the saddle points. And outside you have a, a conical structure around the, um, around the K points. So you can find um, a sim a similarities. You find an analogy between um, this density of states and that of a graphene billiard. So, and to, I mean, we did experiments, but we also did numerical simulations. For the numerical simulations, we used so-called graphene billiards with the shape of a rectangle or the shape of an Africa billiard. And um, to the tight binding model is then written in this form. So the tight binding home Hamiltonian is given by the on-site potential, which is, um, um, which is marked by T0. And then you have um, nearest neighbor, hoppings between nearest neighbors, so between one red and the blue side or blue and red side. Second nearest neighbor coupling between uh, one red side and the next red side, so within one triangular lattice. And uh, for, the, for the description of the experimental results, we even had to take into account third nearest neighbor couplings, so we had to take into account couplings um, in within this circle and along this circle and along the certain circle. But then we found very good agreement uh, between the tight binding model and the experimental results, as I show here. I mean, the red curves are obtained from this tight binding model with up to third nearest neighbor couplings, and the black ones are the experimental results for the density of states. Here you see some kink, uh, which is of importance when you look at spectral properties. And this kink comes from so-called edge states, which are localized along zigzag edges. So along zigzag edges, you will always find edge states, not when you look at the uh, armchair edges. So these are called zigzag edges, and these are the armchair edges. So now, um, what next? What we next did? Now we looked at spectral properties in the region of the band edges, the one over singularities, and the Dirac point. So these are the results in the vicinity of the band edges. We compare to results for the non-relativistic quantum billiard of the same shape. So uh, of the billiard which you would obtain by taking when you take out all the metallic cylinders, and there we find a very good agreement. So the red one is. Uh, numerical results, and the black one are the experimental data. After, I mean, we have to rescale them so that they are on a, have similar scale, uh, scales. And here I compare length spectra. Length spectra obtained by Fourier transforming this fluctuating part. And then you get peaks at the length of periodic orbits. So these are obtained by, you use your, you take your eigenvalues, you compute this fluctuating part of the spectral density, you do a Fourier transform, and then you, when you plot the absolute value uh, versus length, so this is Fourier transform from k, wavelengths k, to length l. Then you get these length spectra, and all these peaks correspond to periodic orbits. So, I mean, Martin spoke uh, about that, and I also spoke about it in the quantum chaos lecture. So, in here and that, so around the band edges, we find very good agreement between the properties of the Dirac billiard and the corresponding non-relativistic um, quantum billiard.
Now when we look in the vicinity, so here, so in the vicinity of the Dirac point, here I just plot some computed wave functions. So there you find edge states. These are states that are localized along the zigzag edges. Along the armchair edges, you have a vanishing um, um, this, this wave function. So these are wave functions for the um, quantum billiard, tight binding model, essentially. Or here, also for the Africa billiard, you find localized states at the zigzag edges. You can also look at the momentum distribution. This is done by Fourier transforming from wave functions to um, a quasi-momentum space. And then you get uh, these structures. They are peaked at the corners, and blue means a vanishing momentum distribution. So here you can, here you don't, you cannot really see it, but here you clearly can see that the momentum distributions around the Dirac point are localized at the six corners of the um, band structure, of the, yeah, of the prion zone, of the first prion zone. Now, and as I explained already, in the region of these Dirac points, the system is described by the um, Dirac equation by the for spin one half particle. So uh, to compare to um, quantum billiards, I used uh, billiard quant relativistic quantum billiards. So there I compare to results uh, which are were obtained for so-called neutrino billiards. I mean, these neutrino billiards were in, um, introduced by Berin Mantragon already in 1987. Then nobody was interested in them anymore until they were able to separate um, graphene sheets. And then um, it got of interest again in the context of relativistic quantum care. So, and I choose, chose such billiards to uh, compare the properties of, a, of the drug billiard, of these microwave billiards, to those of relativistic quantum billiards. And uh, the Dirac equation, I mean, it's called the Dirac equation by Barry and Montragon, even though it's, um, I mean, it's a wild equation because you only look at the, this two-dimensional equation. So you have spin-off functions, are the wave functions, are spin-off functions with two components. And the uh, Dirac Hamiltonian is the, the massless Dirac Hamiltonian, which was introduced by Barry and Montragon, and uh, plus a mass term, which is given by that term here. So in the boundary conditions that uh, define a neutrino billiard, so you have to somehow, you have to impose boundary conditions on the spin one half particle, which moves inside the billiard. Um, and so this is done by requiring that the outward current should, be, should vanish. So you have to, they, they are imposed in this way. You cannot just simply choose the, um, um, the Schlee boundary conditions because then you would have wave functions which are um, com completely vanished. So. Therefore, you cannot simply use, like in the non-relativistic case, the Richelieu boundary conditions. But this is a good boundary condition to confine the spin one half particle to the interior of, a, of the billiard. And here I just show this would be the current. So and as you can see, it has just a tangential component along the boundary, whereas the normal component is equal to zero. So for that case, it seems to be fulfilled. Now to um, when now we when using complex plane presentation instead of x and y, I use w of s equal to x of s plus i times y of s, and the normal vector is then given as e to the i alpha of s, where alpha is the angle between the normal vector and the x-axis. Then you can write down the boundary conditions resulting from this condition. Um, they couple the two spinor components by a phase. And this phase uh, contains the angle of the normal vector with respect to x-axis. You have a question? Uh, wait, I have to give you the phone, uh, micro. Psi is a wave function? Um, psi is a spin-off function. But it's not commuting. Uh, yes. Yes, they are commuting. This, yes. So you have a two dimension you have to think of a two dimensional matrix and then you diagonalize and then you get a two spinor component. So that's um yeah. So that's the definition of the uh, it's just I would have accepted if it was anti commuting, but it's commuting. They are commuting, yes. I mean, as I said, it's a, a two-dimensional. 
Weyl equation, essentially, not the Dirac equation. And it has uh, properties which completely differ from those for non-relativistic billiards. This I will show tomorrow, um, resulting from this uh, phase um, structure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it works very well. I will show. <laughs> so these are normal wave functions like, um, yeah, you can even, I will show plots of them. So you can even plot them. But they have uh, properties. You will see at the end of my talk, you will see one difference between such relativistic billiards and non-relativistic ones. So these are, so what one has to do now, one has um, to solve the, this uh, Dirac equation with this boundary condition, and then one gets the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the corresponding neutrino billiard. And um, I mean, um, for the description of these Dirac billiards, I had to use massive neutrino billiards. There you won't find any agreement as long as the, their mass zero. So I uh, introduced the parameter beta, which is given by the mc over h bar divided by k. So this is a free space uh, momentum, and this is a rest uh, mass momentum. And um, so the non-relativistic limit is reached when this is much larger, when this goes to infinity. So you can look at it uh, from mass zero up to mass equal to infinity. And then you will, as I will show, you will come end up in the non-relativistic limit. So to get a structure for the Dirac equation, which is similar to that for a massless one, you can just in, introduce uh, a rescaling of the wave functions, and then um, you get um, such a wave function. So with boundary conditions, which now differ from those for a massless particle by this um, factor here, where sinus beta is just given by beta over square root plus one beta square. And now um, the non-relativistic limit is reached when you um, approach uh, theta beta equal to pi over two, then this um, K term vanishes, and then second component will vanish, and you will have only one com component left. So they decouple when you go to the non-relativistic limit, and then you will get exactly the um, Schrödinger equation for a, spin, for a spinless particle with Dirichlet boundary conditions. Whereas in the ultra-relativistic limit, you take mass equal to zero. So this k equal to one. And um, so that's, so this is, I mean, a, a variant Montagon, they gave some prescription of how to compute the eigenvalues. And so I could extend their boundary integral method to massive one. And this I will talk about uh, tomorrow. And also, you can derive a Weyl formula, an analog to the one for a quantum billiard. And the only difference is that now this, this term here is missing. So you have just an area term when you for the Weyl formula. So in here, I show just results for the rectangular neutrino billiard and African neutrino billiard. Um, for the rectangular neutrino billiard, you get again Poisson. Whereas for the African neutrino billiard, you get very good agreement with GUE. That is, and this is also understandable because the uh, Dirac equation it, um, violates time reversal invariance. So if you have a chaotic sy a system with a chaotic uh, sh with the shape of a chaotic billiard, then you find GUE for a neutrino billiard. So this is um, this is of importance later because this is what we first was expected. When starting to look at graphene billiards, everybody expected that one would find GUE because of that property. But here I show now the results for the graphene billiard, and here the experimental result for the drug billiard. And here you find Poisson as expected for the rectangular one. However, for the, um, for the Africa shape, you find agreement with GOE and no agreement with GUE. Here I just plot the GOE curve, and this I realized only in the morning, but this is uh, delta three for GOE. So one does not find GUE. And the reason for this is um, that when you, as soon as you have a boundary, so you, you make, um, you, you bind, you, you confine the, the, let, uh, so the graphene sheet to a certain shape, then 
at the boundary, you will have reflections um, that go from one Dirac cone to the other one. So you will have a coupling of the two Dirac equations, Dirac Hamiltonians in the four-dimensional Dirac equation, and, and this will lead then to, um, to GOE. So that was the explanation, and uh, it has been confirmed. But as I will show now, this, um, yeah, okay, so. Now, um, we also looked at properties in the vicinity of the Van Over singularities. I mean, the, um, in the vicinity of the, zone, the Van Over singularities, the waves are um, localized along interior zigzag edges, and the momentum distributions are localized, non-vanishing only along the isofrequency lines which uh, couple the saddle points. And the spectral properties, one has to be careful because here you now have um, the Van Over singularities is in the vicinity of these peaks. So there you cannot uh, simply unfold anymore. But there's another quantity, and this is the so-called ratio distribution, the distribution of ratios of nearest neighbor frequencies, so Fi plus or minus Fi spacing, and the, space, uh, the neighboring spacings. And so and they are dimensionless. That is, for them, you do not need to unfold your eigenvalues. So you do not need to fit to some polynomials. In this case, you would need to fit to a high-order polynomial to get a good unfolding. But then one has to be careful that one does not distort the properties by um, not appropriately unfolding. So there we use ratio distributions. And um, so this is... Um, this is for a rectangular billiard. There you get agreement with Poisson. And for the Africa shape uh, billiard, you get agreement with uh, GOE. So this is um, the ratio distribution. This is the K equal to 1 ratio distribution, which you obtain by choosing here K equal to 1 in these ratios. These are also dimensionless quantities. So here I just use um, the eigenfrequencies, which we obtain from the experiments without any unfolding. And there you can see that um, the, for the Africa shape, it's not GUE as expected, but GOE. So this was one experiment. So now I come back to what I showed to you before. I mean, as I mentioned, we did not only find one Dirac point, but we found a second one. So when you plot now the density of states, then you see one structure which is similar to that of graphene and another one, which is also similar to that of graphene. And in between, there is a, very, a flat band of very high density. So in this was, um, it's not possible to describe this occurrence of this flat band or the occurrence of the second Dirac point by just using um, tight binding model for a graphene structure. So you cannot explain it with that one. But what we then realize is that when you look at the wave function, these were ob we obtained from computations, I mean, um, with a microwave cavity. So the, there's a group in Darmstadt. They develop a program, a software, to compute um, resonance frequencies of metallic structures. And so they computed for us the wave functions. And then when you look now below the flat band and around the first Dirac point, you can see that the electric field indeed is localized between three cylinders. So it forms a hexagonal structure. But when you come in the vicinity of the flat band or above the flat band, you also find localization between two metallic cylinders. So the structure there is not just like here, honeycomb lattice, but it is uh, of that form. And this is exactly the lattice structure, which is, comes from the combination of a honeycomb lattice and a Kagome lat sub lattice. So Kagome. Um, here I just so show one um, basic structure. So and when you when you use such a combination, then you can again write down the type binding model, where we now have um, not only interactions between uh, the honeycomb lattice structures, by lattice sites, but also between honeycomb and Kagome lattice sites, and then you find. Um, exactly the same um, band structure like in our system. So this is a density of states. The blue one is experiment, and the red one is the, um, the result from this tight binding model simulation. So what we ex actually have is a structure which um, uh, corresponds to a honeycomb Kagome subplate structure. I mean, we know that in around the lower drug point, it's very well described by honeycomb lattice structure, but when you 
go beyond this flat band, then you have to use this full structure to, if you want to describe the properties of the Dirac billiard. So and that's um, this result. Now I very, very briefly there we did also experiments in, in, in Lanzhou. There we chose um, Dirac billiard, which has a threefold symmetry. I mean, it, when, when you see here, so it has such a threefold symmetry. It's threefold in the sense that when you rotate from here to here by 120 degrees, then you get um, exactly the same shape. So this was, um, yeah, here you see it again. To construct such a shape, we just use one third of a graphene billiard structure or direct billiard structure and then rotate it by 120 degrees. Then you get a graphene sheet with threefold symmetry. It can be described by such a Hamiltonian structure. So you have a Hamiltonian along the diagonal. These are block structures. These are the Hamiltonians which, type binding Hamiltonians which describe the bike structure of each of these three sides. And these are coupled along these lines uh, with each other, and this is described by this matrix V. And they are all the same. All in each of them, you have the same Hamiltonian because of the threefold symmetry, and also the coupling matrix element entries are the same. So this, this then can be um, brought with a unitary transformation. It can be brought to such a block diagonal structure where one Hamiltonian is a real Hamiltonian, which is just given by the sum of the entries. Another one, it's a complex Hermitian Hamiltonian, and the third one, it's obtained from the second one by complex conjugation. So this is exactly the structure which you would expect when you take a Hamiltonian with threefold symmetry and separate it by symmetries, then you would get one Hamiltonian with, uh, which is rotational invariant. This is like that one. And two Hamiltonians which are change into each other by rotation or by time reversal invariance violation. So this is um, explained here. I mean, the motivation for the experiments comes from experiments which were done um, in 2003. There we did experiments with superconducting cavities which three, with threefold symmetry and compute, uh, found all the eigenvalues, several thousands of eigenvalues, and compared uh, with what you would, um, with predictions for threefold systems. Namely, the prediction is that you will find, depending on the symmetry class, you will find either GOE or GUE. So that was the motivation, essentially. So to, I mean, these systems can be, the wave functions of such a structure can be separated according to their transformation properties. So if you rotate a wave function by uh, 2 pi over 3, then uh, you will get a such a wave function, so it's phi minus 2 L pi over 3 times lambda. And depending on the symmetry class, which is labeled by L equal to 0, 1, or 2, you will have uh, the wave function, uh, again, plus, plus multiplied with a certain phase factor. And this, should, this depends on the symmetry class. When it's rotationally invariant, this corresponds to L equal to 0, then you get a real wave function, which is time reversal invariant. When you uh, take L equal to 1 or 2, then you will get complex wave functions. Even though the system as a whole is time reversal invariant, you get then complex wave functions. And uh, when you apply the time reversal operator to them, then you, um, these are not time reversal invariant. But when you apply the time reversal operator, which in this case is just complex conjugation, you get from psi 1 up psi 2 or from psi 2 psi 1. That is the uh, symmetry properties change. However, since the system as a whole is time reversal invariant, um, you have then the property that the eigenvalues of these must be degenerate. That is, uh, when you look at the spectrum, you have singlets corresponding to the rotational invariant um, parts, and you have doublets corresponding to the eigenvalues of uh, symmetry classes L equal to 1 and 2. So you can do the same with a neutrino billiard, but there the difference is that um, the, I mean, there you can classify, like before, you can classify the components according to their transformation properties, so psi 1 and psi 2. You can classify them into L equal to 0, 1, 2. However, the big difference is that now, uh, when you have, when the component number 1 has symmetry class L, then the component number 2 has symmetry class L minus 1. 
that is a whole the spinor function itself cannot be classified, but its components can be classified. And this has um, some um, consequences about which I will speak tomorrow. I mean, if you choose now a, a neutrino billiard with the shape of an integrable one, then you can get something which is completely different from Poisson. So this I will show tomorrow. But um, the important thing is now, again, that you can classify according to the transformation properties, uh, both in the relativistic and the non-relativistic case. Yeah, I just show computed uh, wave functions for the honeycomb Kagome billiard, so tight binding model results, and compare them to results for the corresponding Dirac billiard. So the wave functions have a very similar structure. So this is in the vicinity of the bent edges. So L equal to zero, L equal to one, L equal to two. And here this is around um, the rack point or here around the upper bent edge. So at the upper bent edge you already have, um, I mean, there it's, well, you can, I know you cannot see it in this band structure. Here in this band structure you can see it. So at the upper band edge, you have already um, some overlap with a flat band in this case. So um, they, look, um, they look different from what you have here in that part. But um, the, they are well uh, reproduced by this honeycomb Kagoma lattice structure. And here I just show the... Um, around the drag point, uh, when you look at the momentum distribution, so I separated by symmetry class, so here we separated by L equal to zero, one, and two, and when you now look at the momentum distribution, then you see that um, for the L equal to one and two, they are only non-zero on one pair of drag points, so either on the K point or on the K prime point, or K minus and K plus point. That is, um, here, in this case, you don't have this intervalley scattering which leads to GOE statistics in, in the Africa period. However, in this case, uh, we have this L equal to 1 and L equal to 2 uh, symmetry classes, and there you expect GUE. So we don't know whether we see now GUE because it's a graphene billiard or whether we see GUE because of symmetry properties. So this is shown here. Here I show the experimental results for the singlets um, and the doublets in red are the experimental results. I mean, around the bandages we had, you, the, the one of the problems is that you, there you have maybe 800 levels, but you have to separate by symmetry, and then you get uh, only one third for each symmetry class. So around 200 for each symmetry class. And these are plotted here in red. So the statistics is not very good. Um, compared to what we have for the graphene billiard, and uh, graphene billiard is shown in green, and the quantum billiard is shown here in blue. For the singlets, you find GOE, and for the doublets, you find GUE in all cases. So the, um, the drug billiard behaves like, and as the graphene billiard behaves like a non relativistic quantum billiard, as long as you are in the region of the band edges. Now, at the um, around the drag point, we compare to results for the neutrino billiard for mass 0, mass 20, and mass 100. I mean, for the experimental results, you find here again something close to GOE, and for the doublet, something close to GUE. And for the neutrino billiard, you find something on top of the GUE curve for mass 0, but um, for this, even for the singlets, because, um, as I said, uh, the rack equation, it violates time reversal invariance, so you find in all symmetry classes, you find their GUE for the massless case. And when you now increase mass, then you come closer to and closer to the results which you obtain for, for the graphene billiard or the Dirac billiard. But, but to get agreement with the relativistic billiard, we had to tune the mass to at least 20. And here the results for the GU case. So, and with this, I, I know here I just show the results for the honeycomb Kagome letters. There you get similar results. I mean, uh, for the singlets, you find something close to GOE. For the doublets, from something close to GUE, both at the band edges and at the Dirac point. So, not as, expect, as would be expected in the very beginning, something um, close to GUE, and, and even not for the singlets. So and that's here, I show the 
um, ratio distributions for which you don't need any unfolding. So here you find, uh, again, I mean, uh, close to, for the singlet, something close to GOE, for the doublet, something close to GUE. So this, uh, the findings have nothing to do with wrong unfolding, so, um, so this is shown here, essentially. And for the honeycomb kagome lattice, you find some similar results as for the Dirac billiard. And I think that Anno here just shows some functions, so I nearly finished because I'm now over time, I just see. So here I just show some uh, computed wave functions for the honeycomb kagome lattice and for the corresponding quantum billiard, so they I mean, they, they have similar structures, so they um, more or less agree. And the, for the duplets also, you find similar structures. There you have something called bouncing ball orbits, and you, these you see uh, when you look uh, at the spectral properties. Um, I can show, on, I will show soon. So there you have bouncing ball orbits, which make lead to deviations from what you would expect for a typical chaotic system. And here are the results for the massive neutrino billiards, here for mass zero, mass 20, mass 100, and so with increasing mass, the structure gets more and more similar to that of the corresponding quantum billiard. When you choose m to infinity, then you are in the non-relativistic limit. So in the spectral properties, as I mentioned here, um, so the Queen is m equal to zero, so it's always close to GUE for singlets and for doublets. And when you increase mass, then you move more and more towards um, GOE. However, here you see the red one. I mean, it's for mass 50. And for, the, for large masses, you see deviations, and these are due to these um, um, bouncing ball orbits, which we saw in the wave function structure. And you can extract them, and then you get, uh, also you, then again, you get a good agreement with GOE. So when the circuitized line shows the results after extraction of these um, um, bouncing ball orbits. And also this is similar here. So you, for the relativistic neutrino billiard, you only get agreement with graphene billiard for sufficiently large masses. And with this, I now finish. So thank you for your um, attention. Thank you very much, Barbara. Very interesting talk. Any questions? Yes. So I have two questions. So the first, <clears throat> in the case of um, uh, the simple uh, space with uh, just a boundary, you you wanted to, uh, I mean, you, you compared the classical with the quantum, yeah. and you could see that the integral one corresponded to a certain function, and the uh, chaotic one to a different uh, spectral function. Uh, but you could, in the classical case, you could uh, calculate which is integral and which is chaotic. Yeah. Can you do the same for these lattices, for instance? I mean, yeah. the, like the honeycomb lattice or the graphene yeah. lattice? Yeah. Can you? Yeah, yeah. But um, there you don't have, a, I mean, when you look at the relativistic billiards, you don't have a classical limit. But so what I do there is look at semi-classical properties. So because right. there you don't have a... Um, right. Yeah, but I mean, I can, I can, okay, sure. But I can imagine at least, uh, so completely... Classical in the sense yeah. of just bouncing a ball yeah. on the on the yeah. lattice with a certain boundary, uh -huh. and I could uh, try to imagine if that is motion is integral or chaotic. yeah okay. But for example, when you have a graphene shape with this structure and also a relativistic quantum billiard with that structure, then you don't find Poisson. Then you find um, I mean in a quantum billiard you would find Poisson, but when you now put in a graphene structure or for the relativistic case, then you find uh, something which is uh, chaotic, pure GOE even. Okay. And that has to do with uh, that, um, I mean, in the Dirac billiard, you have these two components, uh, spinor components, which um, differ, I mean, they have different phases, and this then leads to this chaotic structure there, the phases, the additional phase which you have in the boundary conditions. I see. And uh, the, the second question I, I have is, in terms of uh, application, so I can imagine graphene is an actual material, and yeah. the honeycomb lattice, you can also find some materials. 
So is it useful for any applications to find chaotic systems and compare with integral systems in terms of just getting a piece of material and saying it has chaotic uh, band structure? Yeah, I think um, if you are interested in something that is uh, distributed over the whole surface, for example, then it would be better to use some structure which has a chaotic, the shape of a chaotic billiard, I would so, say. So it's, it's better for what? For... I don't know. I mean, I don't know any for application. For but transport, I think, for instance? Or? Yeah. Yeah, for transport, yeah, I would say yes, because there you have localization if you use the integrable ones, and then, um, yeah, it would be better to have something, yeah, non-localized in a sense. Okay, Nate, I have another question. So I had two questions, too, since you had. Is there a three-dimensional version of these billiards? Uh, yes, there are. Um, Double layer, three layer. Um, no, three dimensional. So you have a sphere instead of a. Ah, you circle. mean for the? I mean, we have. Um, you can also look at a three dimensional quantum billiard. Okay. And you can also look at a three dimensional microwave resonator, but this doesn't have then the analogy to the quantum billiard anymore because I mean the Helmholtz equation is vectorial. And, but you find wave chaos then. Okay, so there is classical and quant, I mean, there's chaotic three-dimensional yeah. results. The this other question I had was the conjectures that you had at the beginning. About yeah. So suppose I start with a circle, yeah. and I just deform it a little bit. I yeah. don't go to the Africa, I just do a little bit. Does that completely change the spectral function? Yes, it can. I, I mean, the pen, when you do a singular perturbation, for example, it's sufficient to just put in here one singular point, uh -huh. and then it will completely change. Okay, okay, that was my question, so thanks. There are points of escape in that case. So, uh, he has a question. Uh, I was wondering about the, the disappearance of the, of the second term in the wheel ah. equation. That has to be only with the fact that you are using the uh, normal boundary conditions, right? It doesn't have to be. No, with it has to do with that you have you have this additional um, spin degree of freedom now, but and this leads to uh, interference, so destructive interference. Um, I mean, you have two components, and they have a relative phase. And when you now compute the uh, Weyl formula, then you can see that um, the terms um, um, cancel each other okay. essentially. But for example, if I have a, a a normal, not relativistic uh, billiard, and yeah. I want to put the boundary condition with the current of the of the uh, wave function of the Schrodinger equation. I would have that term, or I will. Yeah, then you have it. Yeah, I will have the term. But when you, for example, when you use a three-dimensional microwave cavity, I mean, if you have a three-dimensional, um, so when you have a three-dimensional quantum billiard, then you have something like volume divided yeah. by something times k to the power of 3 plus surface times k squared plus something. And if you now use a microwave cavity there, you won't have this term. Okay. It has exactly the same effect that uh, there you have a vectorial equation and the terms cancel each other. Okay, thanks. So it's similar to that one. Any other question? Well, I have one. I mean, <laughs> I have one... Uh, probably extremely elementary. But the point is, if I remember correctly, uh, one of the characteristics of the experiments at the times of Bojigas and those and uh, the calculations by Barry were that the energy spectrum couldn't be degenerate, uh -huh. if I remember, okay? Yeah. So, well, then w what worries me with, uh, when you put things like this honeycomb or graphene, yeah this kind of thing, the, the, I mean, it seems to be that, uh, that the whole, all the results depend only on the shape of the boundary because the honeycomb lattice will be degenerate at G6 only. Yeah. So, so, it, so it's only, I mean, it seems to be that it doesn't matter what you put in the billiard. Is uh, all that matters is the boundary. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. okay. So we, I mean, we also did experiments where we um, didn't cut along uh, the sides of a graphene yeah. billiard, but uh, 
Um, I mean, where we didn't, so metallic cylinders usually, where, where we cut along the metallic cylinder, and then you get deferring boundary conditions, and then you can see um, different effects. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much for a very nice lecture. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>